flat. Yes. When, when you say famine is there, that means there's no food in the village at all, is that right? No. no food. Is what, what, is she, what is she saying about her little boy? She says that uh, she, uh, her uh, baby is suffering from disease and uh, it is uh, due to food, shortage of food. Excuse me, is this, is this the first food they're getting since ah, they've arrived? This is the first food, well, the first food in weeks, is it? Or? The Soviet Union, with the biggest air force in the world, has lent Bangladesh nine creaking helicopters, which break down more than they fly. The world's new rich, the oil producers, have offered some petty cash. Saudi Arabia, for example, recently gave Bangladesh the equivalent of less than five days' food. But of course the oil countries don't like dealing with bankrupt economies, even though rising oil prices have helped to cause this famine by putting petroleum-based fertilizers out of the reach of poor countries. Which means that this starving child, the son of a farmer, will probably die. <laughs> Recently, a foreign aid official visited Bangladesh for three days. He told me about a cable he sent to his government recommending a reduction in emergency relief aid to Bangladesh. He sent the cable on the basis of one helicopter trip. He said, the trouble with these people is that they have no get up and go, no success motivation. The judgment of this official is shared by other foreign diplomats here, who justify their ability to sit and watch people die by talking incessantly about local corruption which of course exists, as the starving old woman in the village said. But need I say that this corruption is the universal symptom of a society caught in a never-ending cycle of poverty, war, catastrophe, and a scarcity of everything that is taken for granted in the West, like fresh water, and milk powder, and doctors, and blankets, and edible food. Is this corruption, or is the real corruption the world's culpable neglect of this ravaged country? Could you ask her how old her little boy is? Three years. That's three. Yeah. He's extremely ill, isn't he? Yeah. What did you say? He says that uh, uh, he's, he's a bad stomach and then uh, he had fever also. She's come here to Dhaka to get food. Will he survive? There are just 75 hospital beds for children in all of Bangladesh. That works out at one bed per million of population. None of the sick and starving children in this camp will ever see a hospital. This used to be a soap factory. It is now a famine relief centre near Dhaka and several thousand people are here. Almost all of them are starving and many of the young children are suffering from typhoid, smallpox and a thing called black fever. Many of them are dying. Not long ago, Dr Henry Kissinger made his first visit to Bangladesh, squeezing it in between the Middle East and Moscow. He drove straight from the airport to the Intercontinental Hotel, talked for one hour with the Prime Minister, returned to the Intercontinental Hotel, held a press conference, drove back to the airport and left. Shortly after that, President Ford, on Dr. Kissinger's recommendation, halved the proposal for American emergency aid to Bangladesh. Instead, Bangladesh will receive more of the same from America. Boxes of army surplus biscuits and consignments of tents, on which is written, important campers, don't forget to have fun. <laughs> On December the 28th, 1974, Sheikh Mujib declared a state of emergency in Bangladesh. There were shootings, arrests, and signs that Bangladesh is fast approaching political chaos as a direct result of this famine. Of course, it used to be said that starving people disturb nobody, and this certainly applies to the thousands of dead in this horrific cemetery. But Bangladesh is at the center of Asia, with borders on China, India, and Burma. And when those who somehow manage to survive this famine are finally in political turmoil, they will, I'm afraid, disturb everybody. The people of Bangladesh may then at last assume a strategic value, 
and disturb even Dr. Kissinger. They may even disturb the United Nations, which ignores its own charter by its meanness to Bangladesh, and the Soviet Union, which heaps so-called friendship on Bangladesh and little else, and Australia, which mocks Asia with cliches about partnership while its surplus wheat stays in its silos, and the so-called internationalist common market, whose behaviour toward the starving of Bangladesh is that of a mean little burger, and Britain with its traditional goodwill and two idle helicopters. But of course the West has given something to Bangladesh, a disease called inflation. If you've been horrified by what you've seen, then good. No doubt the commercials in a minute's time will offer reassurance to those who feel they need it. The truth is that Bangladesh and Britain have been caught in the same blizzard of inflation, energy crisis and shortage, with the one difference. When prices go up in Britain, no one dies. When prices go up in Bangladesh, thousands die. You see, it's no longer a question of pity and charity. To hell with that. Their struggle to survive is our struggle. Beat it in Bangladesh and you beat it in Britain. It's really a simple choice that has little to do with the brotherhood of man. The alternative is that we are all expendable. <laughs>